This is Pastor Trevor Thomas from Kononia Ministries in Durban, South Africa. The title of my sermon today is Know the Times. My reading is taken from Revelation 10 verses 1 to 11 as read by Tatum Thomas from the ESV, the English Standard Version. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud, with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun, and his legs like pillars of fire. He had a little scroll open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea, and his left foot on the land, and called out with a loud voice like a lion roaring. When he called out, the seven thunders sounded, and when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up what the seven thunders have said, and do not write it down. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, that there would be no more delay, but that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go, take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel, who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, Take and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it. It was sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And I was told, You must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. I pray the Lord adds his blessing to the reading of the Holy Scriptures today. Many years ago, I read a statement that got burnt into my heart. It was made by Martin Lloyd-Jones, who said, that when knowing the times, we must have the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. Certain men of this caliber revolutionize your worldview, which stays with you for many lifetimes. This is a very good perspective. Our perilous times have exposed some serious dangers which will throttle the church if we as preachers don't own up to our sorry plight when found out. One danger. I have discovered great sermons from preachers and only because they were faithful to the word and alert to the times. On the other hand, those preachers who have no punch, they sit at their television screens with an aimless pastime, just watching the news, perhaps. They have not connected the news landscape with the Bible. <laughs> Another danger, fishing the internet for sermons usually takes many to glamorous sites where no substance breeds. we got to get back to many Bible translations and great biblical tools and commentaries. Don't think that a three-year degree is the end of your study. Your study only begins after completion and ends when you leave your winding sheets behind as soon as your coffin is being transported to the land of the dead, to know the times, 
We need to know the depths of God's word. And it takes serious study. I owe my research to Greg Beal, Joel Beakey and other commentators faithful to scripture. So in light of this, my title is Know the Times. And I have three thoughts which are a sound that will awake, a chance you can't take, and a mark you must make. I open with my first thought being a sound that will awake, verses 1 to 4. In this hour there is a very real sound in the world. It is echoing from country to country. It is a sound of evil, the idolatrous gods of Sodom and of Egypt that reappeared in Rome, which killed Jesus, reappears with different faces in every generation. Don't just point your finger at the greed of the world, which has toppled our civilization. See how this greed has paralyzed the church. We are still preaching messages that nurse our feelings. We are still singing songs that marinate our emotional taste buds. We are still testifying to what God hasn't done lately. And why is that the diagnosis of our situation? We love to listen to our own sound. We are caught onto the sound waves of the spirit of the age. There is one true burden from the Lord. We think that the book of Revelation is a closed book. And even if we go there, we have some fancy ideas about what that book should sound like. We think that studies of the end times are just a controversial subject. We better leave it for the giraffes. The Spirit declares that we seek out the whole counsel of God. You may just be shocked that this book speaks to the issues of our day. God gives John reflections concerning the sounds of the Old Testament. This gives the lessons a sense of urgency and a sense of prophecy. Not the prophecy that is so common today, but the kind where we are biblically and theologically prophetic. So there is an interlude in our text, an interlude between the sixth and seventh trumpets. An interlude gives you time to transcend your subject. Transcend means that you step back and figure out what went before. It is time to think, to reason, and then to feel the weight of the serious things at hand. Much contention has arisen as to who the mighty angel is. Some say it is Jesus, and some say it is a representative of him. I think that both will work effectively. I wrestled with this as well. I try to view this from another lens. We see angels obediently doing the bidding of the Lord Jesus Christ. To me, I see the absolute sovereignty of Christ as the result of his crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, and session. If there is a closeness of Christ and angels, then how much more we need his closeness to us in this hour? I ask you, how is your relationship with Christ? Is he just your saviour? Or is he also your Lord as well? How long are you going to defer between two opinions? Time is running out, and having half a Christ or half a Christianity will sink the titanic of your own fancy. It is a churchianity of invention, 
this mighty angel is Christ, who one day visited Abraham under the oaks of Mamre. He has a sound that we need to awaken to. When you get to know him, he takes you to his mountain, and then, instead of seeing the dark clouds, you see his sunshine. Only from the view of the mountain can you see what is really there. From the valley, you only see the dark clouds. But on the mountain of being seated in heavenly places with Christ, you clearly see his light that he has made a covenant with you through the rainbow. Don't lose sight that the mountain you are on is Calvary. Calvary has so changed you that you are dying to tell others to have the same experience, a thought we will take up later in my message. But on the other end, the sound of truth has not echoed in our space. Every space is eventually being polluted. The sight of Jesus standing with one foot upon the earth and another foot upon the sea is his absolute sovereignty. The sight of him holding the little scroll that is opened is that truth that must be open at all times. We have settled for lies in our preaching. There is no escape. The seven thunders are the sign of God's burning, holy anger, his fierce judgment. It is a sound that will awaken you. You have to repent concerning your view of him, that he is only a humble lamb. He is the true roaring lion. In Amos 3, 4 and 8. John was commanded not to write and communicate the judgment to come. It must be sealed. In this, God is giving us a chance to repent. And this leads me to my second thought. A chance you can't take. Verses 5 to 8. What I saw in my generation were times of laughter and sadness. We had godly spiritual fathers who we looked up to. Today, we have greedy CEOs clinging near pastors' positions, impatiently waiting to drive the church further into the world. The few Bible colleges that taught essential truths were sidelined for colleges that were dining with the devil, like Dickens, I'd say was indeed the best of times and the worst of times. Today it is worse than ever. I am a key witness to how such colleges have damaged youngsters then who are today grown men. I sound my voice today. People, if you are called by the Lord's name, it is time to arise and shine. It is time to wake up to the trumpet sound, your situation may be like the thief on the cross who had one chance. You can't afford to take the chance that continues business as usual. You can change that classroom you are using at the school for your church into a center for the gospel, into a center for gospel truth. You can change that office you are using for your church as a center for evangelism, for those who belong to Christ's kingdom, there is only one place of safety. Prepare the truth. Study the truth. Labor in the truth. Sacrifice for the truth. Preach the truth. Hear the truth. Walk the truth. Sleep the truth. And die for the truth. The angel is Jesus Christ. Yes, he took an oath. He swore by his own name, Hebrews six sixteen to 18. When we hold on to the truth, his oath secures us in him. He is our refuge. He is our rock. He is our Lord. 
There is another aspect to the oath. Everything that true prophets spoke, everything that true preachers spoke, everything that true witnesses spoke, an oath is made to vindicate them. There will be no delay. An oath confirms the seventh trumpet will sound. Thousands of years have gone by, but God will judge sin. It is according to his eternal decrees, all the decrees that false preachers, false apostles, and false prophets have made, will be judged. If God himself can say to both Daniel the seer and John the revelator to seal certain things up, who are puny little men to reveal things they invent? They even make up their own decrees. Daniel was given much into the future, but was stopped by God. John was given more because of Christ's redemptive work. But we are still living in the already and not yet aspect of the kingdom of Christ. I urge you to know the times. I shed many tears that God should privilege me, a worm of the dust, to study his word. For studying his word for over a generation, I am a student still. The spirit of secularism and humanism has enticed the body of Christ that they are unable to see the dangerous deception that can be irreversible. In the world it is easy to bribe, easy to steal, easy to corrupt, and easy for a hundred and one sins. The evil kingdom thinks it is winning, but there is a most staggering irony here. God's victory over Satan's evil kingdom of the ungodly will suddenly happen like the blast of a trumpet. Just when they are persecuting the godly, there is a greater danger than danger itself when those in the church have borrowed these techniques from the ungodly. Then what? They persecute the godly in the church the trumpet of judgment will blast for them as well. How do we bring these ungodly tricks to a halt in the church of God? You let the spirit and the word have the last word. You want to try tricks? It is a chance you can't take. Jesus Christ is judge, jury and executioner. With the help of how to bring the sinner face to face with God. May we tell the persecutor not to play with his persecutions of the church, his evil words against the building of the church, his evil counsel deceiving others not to tithe to the church. Make him realize that all those tricks of persecution are actually God's secret weapon to eventually win over him. But the blood of the secret persecutor in the church is boiling. His head is turning. His anger is burning. He is in the very heart of the church, right in the council. He is breeding persecutors after his profession, just dress Christianity up with the garments of Babylon, and what do you see? Just a drop of the red ink of false doctrine has contaminated the clear water of sound doctrine in the beaker of the church. But verse 7 tells us that the mystery of the gospel of God will eventually be fulfilled through the remnant. The word announce means preach and it will be accomplished because God's plan that the faithful must preach cannot fail.
fail. This leads me to my last thought, which is a mark you must make, a mark you must make, verses 9 to 11. There is another group of people, the sincere unbelievers, who are asking questions. If marginal and superficial Christianity sucks you, will you not be in a position to offer them some Christ-glorifying and Christ-honoring answers? It is obvious, isn't it? You are consumed by the spirit of this age. You are making a mark for yourself and so you cannot make a mark for Christ. You gave yourself away to the world. It has paralyzed and blurred your view of God and His ways. Your vision of judgment is the lemon twist after a pungent Indian cuisine. You laugh and mock at God's judgment. The trend of the church in the majority has not taken a step towards witnessing for Christ. I mean truly witnessing. It is a shame on us. From our pastors to our people, we are being oppressed if not possessed by demons. God sealed the revelation to John because he wanted him and us to learn to depend upon him in prayer for the answers. Oh, the wings of prayer. It changes people and people with God, walking with them, shake mindsets, ideologies, kingdoms and schemes. One day, a brilliant doctor came into my studio to learn the organic method of guitar technique. He made certain of the fact that he was an atheist and so I would respect his views. But during that month of his enrollment, I was in daily evening public prayer with my family. Then suddenly, one day before the lesson, he made a salient point about why corruption exists in the realm of politics. His view made him see a noble angle. I candidly took him to the angle of teleology. Teleology is just a fancy word for purpose or design. But I showed him God the designer. So my worldview was God. The manner and spirit of the few words in conversation entered into a discussion of a proper view of the gospel. He was awestruck of a God who is the designer of life. When I took him to Abraham and his son Isaac on Mount Moriah, I spoke of God's design from the beginning and how he had a purpose for Abraham, how God had miraculously made Abraham new again. And that was the reason Jesus spoke of him as one who saw Jesus' day and rejoiced. The doctor owned up to the fact that he knew that story but the application took him to another level. Beloved saints, our view of God is that we have made him too small. We have made him very small. We are ashamed of him. Think of the days of soccer and cricket and any other fancy of how thrilled we get your climate is the atmosphere that grows you. We lived in the day where we would sit for hours drinking from the well of the scriptures. 
we experienced the thunder, the rainbow, and the lightning of how scripture was opened to us. When there is no plurality of elders, God will take one man and use him. I remember that right behind the pulpit in that little church, there was a library that the minister placed for the benefit of his people. He wanted them to read, to read, and to read. We got the message. That made me a reader. Friends, there is a mark that you must make. I am not talking about the marks we have already been making by the numerous pastors' breakfasts we have come out of, neither the message of boasting and short-lived success. I am talking about the burden God has placed upon Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and others. I am talking about a message burning in your bosom, where you have a burning desire to share it, not because you want to draw attention to yourself. No, we must be in the dust and want to change people and change the world for Christ. What message is this in our Revelation passage? It is both a sweet message and a bitter message. So it is bittersweet. Get rid of that cliché, I want to be positive. You will end up being a fraud. And there are many frauds around. Come on now, you've got to eat the word. This means that you've got to digest it. What is the symbolism concerning this type of speech? You must take the gospel like the Samaritan woman, to her innermost being. You must take it deep down into your heart, and then only will the depths of living water come out of you. Oh, friends, the trumpets are sounding in this hour. People are dying. They need the both and, both the love and the judgment of God, not the either or. Not either love or judgment. If you can identify with these things, then you must witness. Remember that time when the scriptures were difficult, but when God opened them up to you, you began to understand this little scroll here must be your scroll that you must become part of. You must identify with eating the scroll, which means you will be able to identify with its message. Then you will learn to become people-centered, and then you will identify with their problems. There are those within your circles that need to understand the gospel. Show them the way. You believe it, right? Now tell it. I come to a closing. Two scenes that are bookend marks I can never wash out of my mind from the movie The Cross and the Switchblade. In the opening scene, the narrator says, if the story you are about to see were the product of a writer's imagination, you might label it unbelievable. But these events took place on the streets and alleys and the tenements where we filmed them, in the shadow of the bridge. In the closing scene, Nicky Cruz says, Cool it! I said, cool it now. Weren't you listening to the preacher? Well, I heard the preacher. I don't know how to say it, preacher. Haven't you heard the preacher? To which David Wilkerson, the preacher, said, 
is here. You feel him. But a scene before this, in the sermon he says, There is nobody in this world that can tag you, because nobody knows how you feel inside. Because your mind, your feelings, your spirit are so fantastic, it would take a mind bigger than the whole world to understand you. I'm going to talk about a man, and I'm going to talk about love. Love is the gutsiest act you will ever do, because love is turning away from hate. Each gang member in your gang wants to kill the opposite gang member. All I hear is what a rotten deal we've all got. But let me tell you something. Jesus Christ was perfect and they crucified him with not one complaining word. When he died on that cross, he was a man. He was finished on that cross. So you won't have to die here today. Your sins are paid up. Just open your heart and let all that bitterness come out and let Jesus Christ come in. Those words echoed in that auditorium that day. Let Jesus Christ come in, come in, come in, come in, come in, come in. And Nicky Cruz, the fiercest gangster and warlord, got saved that day. Christ is ready to save anyone, even today. Until next time, the shalom, the peace of God remain with you. And now unto him who is able to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only wise God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Thank you for listening to this sermon. If you wish to hear more from Trevor Thomas, please like and share this video. Make sure to subscribe to the channel Apostolic Witness and to turn on the notification bell. May the Lord bless and keep you.